I would say also invest in some acting lessons, really, even though deep down you don't think you need them. I promise you, you do. Uh, you know, save up, stop buying magic tricks. Stop giving all your money to the magic retailers. Save up and invest in some acting lessons. Uh, that 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 you know will will pay you more dividends than chasing the next big thing. Yes, I can. Thank you. Yep. Oh, fantastic. With all this technology I'm doing is supposed to be uh, tech savvy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Did you, send, did, you, did you send it to the wrong email address? Yes, I did. Right. Yeah, that, that .co.uk catches a lot of people out. Oh, no, it's because uh, I, I was sending it to the Queen. Ah, to the Queen. <laughs> no, no wonder nobody joined. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So, uh, what time is it in your area? It's quarter past five in the afternoon. Okay. Five, yeah, PM. Yeah, five fifteen PM. And getting ready for supper or? Oh no, I've I've uh, I haven't eaten yet, so I'll, I'll be eating later on. But I had quite a big lunch, so uh, I'll be eating later. Yeah. Cool, cool. So, uh, well, I'll step right into it. Basically, what uh, yep. I've already started at the interviews uh, with other uh, people. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Alexander uh, McAleer, Alexander Marsh. Um, the name's familiar. I wouldn't say I'm overly familiar, but yes, I, I do know the name. He's from the uh, UK as well. Uh, and when I was chatting with him, uh, I, w I was explaining that, like, I, I was saying, uh, so uh, do you, did you speak to uh, Peter Turner? Or Because in my mind, I was like explaining to him that in the, since I saw like a couple of the people that I follow are from UK, I thought that everyone just hangs at the pub together. You guys all know each other. It's like the, no. the superhero clan, you know? No, I think I, I, I haven't seen Pete Turner in about, well, eight years perhaps since I've seen Pete Turner. I used to see, I used to see him quite a lot uh, in the, the early stages of his career, but uh, I haven't but, seen him for uh, many years. And uh, the same with my, Alex McAleer. Uh, probably even longer, probably 12 years since I last, last saw him. So, uh, so no, there used to be, but when, again, probably 15 years ago or something, there used to be a bit of a sort of click when Pete Turner and Luke Jamey, and when I was first starting out and a few others, you know, there, there, there did used to be this little nucleus that once in a while we used to meet and get drunk in the pub and, you know, uh, but all of that sort of faded away now, you know, they, they, they were the glory days. <laughs> uh, well, I could imagine that, that that could be quite fun because uh, the ideas that could be generated at such a meeting could be uh, quite substantial, I think. Yeah, what may, what usually happened is everybody got drunk and Pete Turner, <laughs> tried, to, Pete Turner tried to chat up all the barmaids and failing, <laughs> that, failing, failing that, he hypnotized everybody. So that, <laughs> then, then, And then we'd go for a curry afterwards and that was generally how it went. <laughs> okay, okay. Because uh, I know he's quite elusive because uh, he's traveling so much and uh, on and off we're just discussing. But I think that uh, currently there's the uh, the event in uh, Las Vegas, uh, Magic Live. Uh, yeah. Have you ever been by any chance? Uh, no, I've, I've, been to, I've, been to, I've been to I've been to Vegas before. I've done uh, some lectures in Vegas, but I've never been to Magic Live. No, no. OK, uh, neither have I. Uh, well, basically, the, the goal of the whole project was uh, for me to reach out and to create a sort of series where uh, we could do, uh, dwell into how people develop their ideas, how like uh, within a creative process, how individual creators think and go about these steps. Uh, in my research, I found out that there's five steps to a creative process. The first being uh, inspiration. So basically, I'm thinking the day to day. 
everything that you have behind yourself, the accumulation of, you know, those all ideas, the story, the plots, whatever, it all goes into that memory bank. Yeah. Second stage would be incubation. So basically those ideas, they're just there, they're marinating, and they're just wait, waiting for that step three, that illumination, eureka moment. Yeah. You know, where for me personally, when I have that, I get up and I have to work at it right away. And usually yeah. my girlfriend doesn't see me for another couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the fifth, uh, the fourth stage would be the uh, exploration of how to construct this idea, building different prototypes, cutting throughout the, the fat, getting to a final product. And to finalize with the fifth step, which would be the uh, implementation. How do you implement that and get it out there into the real world? Uh, it, so far with my speaking with certain people, I realized that although the structure, you know, it seems to be quite, you know, uh, ordered, certain phase makes senses. I speak to certain people where they kind of have things mixed up, like those cubes are they're rearranged, where yeah. certain people yeah. I realize they develop the tool before the, the need. Hmm. I'll yeah. give you an example. I was speaking to uh, Fedon Bilek, another uh, uh, mind reader and uh, mentalist. And he's explained to me that his process is example, okay, I'm, I want to build something mechanical. It's handheld. He doesn't know what he's making yet, but he's making a can opener, you know? So he's making, okay, <laughs> it, it opens, it opens things, it's yeah. handheld, you know? And then that moment uh, it's, you know, it turns yeah. into what, but I don't, I don't work like that personally. So for you, let's say uh, step one, the uh, creative process is uh, an inspiration. I think that you, you seem like someone who's very, um, like you seem to, I, I don't know you personally, but I would, uh, I'm guessing someone who reads a lot, who's very analytical. Uh, there's a sensitivity to your work um, because from my understandings, you kind of steer away from the technical aspects to kind of grind it down to the emotional. Mm. And yeah. uh, from, that's what I like from your work is that it's very impactful because it's very primal. There's no guesswork in, I saw him do this kind of like weird shuffle in the back of my mind, maybe he did something, you know? Yeah. Uh, so for mm -hmm. your inspiration part of it, uh, how do you go about keeping that uh, fresh and live and, uh, you know, like percolating? Mm. Well, my, 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 I've, I've always been slightly different from most mentalists and bizarre magicians and I sort of get Put in all sorts of different camps you know one person will say i'm a mentalist another person will say i'm a, I'm a bizarre magician and i think that happens because I, I don't really fit in with any sort of classic genre of of magic um mainly i think because i came to magic very late in life my inspirations really are m movies first and foremost i'm a huge movie buff especially horror films exactly sci-fi you know uh fantasy movies uh marvel movies you know that, that whole sort of what's called genre that that whole sort of um side of things um, horror movies in particular and so my inspirations um I, and i do read a lot and in my youth i used to read a lot more i used to read a lot of ray bradbury stephen king clive barker again horror sci-fi uh fantasy no, type stuff um and so my inspiration when i when i came into the world of magic for want of a better word my inspiration was always sort of the theatrical the um the sort of the story based thing you know i wasn't interested in tricks you know i wasn't interested in how tricks work i, I didn't watch darren brown on tv and try and analytically figure out how he'd done that piece of mind reading that he'd done i wasn't really interested in that what i was interested in was the emotional response that he was getting um and how that was telling and the whole the whole idea of telling a story so my inspiration has always been uh, almost theatrical to to create an emotional experience for the for your volunteer for your audience. Mm -hmm. So um, I've I've always steered away from this idea of the magician as being the wisecracking yeah. center of attention, the show off, the guy. I, and I, I hate the, I I hate this whole concept that you see if you receive emails from some from various magic companies. This whole concept of wow, this trick really fooled me. Well. Yeah who cares you really exactly. who cares if it fooled you that's not entertainment is it, it, yeah, it instead of it amazed me yeah yeah it fooled the me. fooling that, aspect is not yeah. correct it's not the right it, approach 
No, it seems to be that, but but it, 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 for the companies, for the magic companies, it obviously is the right approach. Otherwise, they wouldn't use it. They they quickly change tax if it wasn't selling stuff. So it obviously does what does work, which says to me that you know perhaps perhaps as high as ninety percent of all people who buy buy tricks from from magic companies online are really only interested in fooling people. That's, yes, that's their that's their motivation that they want to go to the go to the bar uh, and f fool their friends or fool a girl in the in the, in the, in the mistaken idea that the, the girl's going to want to have sex with them because they managed to fool them with the trick. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> So, you know, so, so that, that clearly, so I, I, I clearly do not fit in in that bracket. You know, I, I'm not remotely interested in fooling anybody. What I want is for people to enjoy an experience, to enjoy a story, to be, to be taken on an, a, a almost emotional experience. So, uh, so that is my motivation. And that comes from really from not being immersed in the world of magic at, at all, uh, really, even, even even when that, you know, when I when I started out on this career, and I used to go to conventions and things, I was always more interested in getting back to the hotel room and watching a movie than going to the gala show and watching magicians. So my motivation has always been stories, really t telling a story, and that's what I try to do in in the work that I've done. And uh, in regards to storytelling. In my research, I was doing in regards to you uh, because the, there's volumes and volumes of work. Uh, it's hard to say uh, uh, you're known for one specific thing. It's more of like an ensemble uh, within a, a, a genre and your approach to it, you know. But within the things I was researching, uh, from my understanding, you you actually had an encounter with uh, with a spirit. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Which, which, is, which is another inspiration, and I, I yeah, exactly. I, I, I'm wondering how old were you when this happened? Uh, and well, uh, uh, the story is, and, and it's an absolutely true story. You know, I have nothing to gain from lying to you about <laughs> it or make, making it up. It's absolutely true. When I was about 14 years old, I was with a friend. He was about the same age as me, and um, back in those days, of course, there was no there was no Xboxes or Playstations or Netflix. You, you sort of had to make your own entertainment. So what kids teenagers used to do really was just wander the streets you know looking for trouble to get into you know we'd hang out on street corners meet our friends uh before you know uh, before we had, we had to go back to our parents' house um and me and a friend about nine o'clock at night and this was in the in in sort of in the, in the autumn in the fall so about nine o'clock at night it was getting dark um and we were just heading home just walking on the street and we went across the crossroads and I was lucky enough to be raised in quite a sort of leafy suburban type area. And on one corner of the crossroads was a big house with a gravel drive that led up to it. Um, really almost like a sort of spooky mansion type house. And in the middle of the garden, there was a, a, a grass lawn area in the front of the house. And then it was all surrounded by trees. And we saw a ball of light about the size of a tennis ball, just floating in the middle of the lawn. And then we sort of stopped and were looking at it and you know couldn't fight, figure out what it was and then suddenly this ball of light burst into ribbons of light that shot around the garden shooting around you know like almost like spirits shooting around and then they all came together and formed the image of a bride floating about <laughs> three feet off the ground and and i could see her face i could see the the, the, the bride's veil i could see her yeah. face behind the veil i could see all the folds of her dress but i could still see the trees on the other side of the garden from me she was transparent i could see through her i could see the trees and it's the only time in my life that i've been literally scared stiff my my, yeah. my I, I was thinking to myself i was thinking just run 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 but my body was just locked solid just wouldn't move mm -hmm. just simply would not move and then after just a few seconds um the bride sort of burst into these ribbons of light again shot around the garden and then just faded away and me and my friend turned around and we ran all the way home and what, what sort of makes it especially sort of impressive as it were is that we both saw the same thing it's not yeah. like it was me hallucinating it wasn't no. like me um having a, a waking dream or you know or or, or 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 just imagining that i'd seen something we both saw independently of each other we both saw the same thing but we never talked about it we never that was one of the yeah, weird things that we, we never mentioned it to, to each other uh but following that i mean i was fine after that i was, I was quite excited that i seen a ghost because i was into all this you know i was into all the weird stuff so to actually see a ghost was like validation for me that this stuff 
could be true. Mm -hmm. But my friend, um, he had uh, almost like a mental breakdown afterwards. He okay. he said that, that, that and, and, and I believe that this can some people who have these sort of paranormal um, experiences sometimes do have, you know, it does sort of almost um, like, cascade to something else. Yeah, cascade like a domino effect where, yeah. where other weird things start to happen. Yeah, and he he said that he could see weird, strange things. He lived in a, in an apartment with his wife, with with his uh, mother. He said he could see strange things that people were trying to kill him. That there, there were people outside the house waiting to kill him. And all okay, that led something completely other. He it, like led him towards paranoia. Yeah, yeah, and he he wouldn't go. He used to he used to go to um what we call um a public school, which is like a boarding school. Where you, mm -hmm. and he would he refused to go back. He wouldn't go back to school. And for a couple of years, he would, you know, he stopped socializing. He wouldn't come out with, with his friends anymore. I remember one time he's, we, we actually knocked on the, on his door to see if he would come out to play. And he sort of opened the door just by a crack and just wouldn't let us in, didn't want us to be there, just sort of told us to go away. And then years later, you know, about six or eight years later, I was in the local pub with a girl who I'd just met and um, I think it was like, like our, our second or third date. And so for something to talk about, I said, oh, have you ever seen a ghost? And she was like, <laughs> oh, no, I've no, never seen a ghost, no. So I said, oh, well, I have, and told the story. <laughs> and as, as, as luck would have it, the guy no. who I'd seen the ghost with was, was stood <laughs> by the bar, literally an arm's length away. And so not thinking, I just turned around to him, and his name was Jim, just turned around to him and said, hey, Jim, do you remember that the ghost of the bride that we saw? And he didn't say a word. He didn't say anything. He just stood there and started to cry. Oh my you know, God. Tears rolling down his face. And after, you know, I never mentioned it again after that to him, you know, because uh, quite clearly it still affected him. Yeah. So that was a huge sort of, uh, you know, when I look back on that night, that obviously had a huge influence on who I was, what I became, the work that I did in the sort of magic world, as it were. And just recently, I've started, I wrote uh, a theatre play no yeah. magic in it at all, uh, called The White Dress, which um, takes that story as its base. Um, I've transposed it back into uh, the, ninth, the early part of the 20th, 20th century, uh, almost, almost as a metaphor for the grief and sorrow felt at the end of the World War I. Yeah, yeah, and also, yeah. And also the, uh, the Spanish flu that sort of killed more okay. people in World War I, that sort of yeah. killed swept around the globe so it's quite relevant to us now you know with all that's going on in europe at the moment and uh and covid is you know there are you know 100 years ago people went were going through the same sort of thing and so we've just um i got a, a group of actors together and a director and 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 uh, we we performed its debut um in the middle of april uh in this wonderful venue that's a 16th century museum it's a wow. house from the 16th century uh, that hasn't been changed at all it, it <sighs> survived it's and in the middle the of a, uh, only a small capacity, as you can imagine. It's sixteenth-century house. It's not a big place. Um, uh, so there, there were there were thirty people in the audience, uh, but we were telling this ghost story, and the audience were sort of you know you could reach out and touch the audience. They were so close to us, yeah. And and it was just an amazing experience. And literally, two minutes before <laughs> we we met on Zoom, another venue that I've been trying to get into, a Victorian theatre that houses about 80 to 100, and it's supposed to be a haunted Victorian theater. And we've been trying to get in for, for weeks and weeks and months, but they, you know, pe nobody knows who we are. So it's a bit like, oh, well, you know, send details through and we'll have a look at it and no, yeah. and nobody wants to know. But lit literally two minutes before you sent the Zoom link, I was on the phone, The guy, I was sat here waiting for you to send the Zoom link, and yeah. the guy phoned and said, hi, it's, it's Kevin from the Lantern Theater. Can we talk about dates for your show? And I'm like, I'm like, oh great, that's fantastic. But I'm thinking, I knew you would be sending, <laughs> you'd be sending the no. Zoom link. So, so I was thinking, <laughs> okay, yes, great, yeah. And check, checking my emails, thinking, you know, but luckily it all worked out well. So, uh, so yes, so that's the story of the ghost story that inspired me. And now where I'm heading sort of artistically, as it yeah. were, is into performance. Like a full circle of that. Yeah, and it's, it's performance that hasn't got any tricks in it. There is no magic, there's no mentalism, there's no bizarre magic, it, it, it is just a, theater show you know um which I, I i really like because the one thing i always hated about doing shows was the tricks <laughs> I, I, I could go out in front of an audience and talk all night long 
tell stories, do whatever. Uh, but the one thing I hated was when you have to make the move, you have to do the thing, you have to press the button, yeah. or you have to, or you have to get the thumb tip on your. Yeah. You know, and I always, I was always dreading that there would be somebody in the audience who saw what I did. I wouldn't be going. I know what you did there. And so I, 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 I'm quite happy to get away from that because that was the one thing I didn't like. And of course, you can use tricks as a vehicle for, for storytelling and it can sort of move the narrative forward. But for me, I would far rather have the narrative without the tricks, which is why all the mentalism I tended to do, almost 95% of it was propless, was all, you know, pseudo hypnosis or... or That's why I sent you that, uh, that, that book of mine. Because I yeah, knew absolutely. it was process and there was no, uh, so uh, within your, your sort of work, I was like, uh, I, d I came across something where you could uh, do a divination of a thought of, thought of card without having any physical cards at all, you know, just based on maths, you know? Yeah. But uh, at the same time, like, like you say, when you're so engaged in the moment, the less technical stuff that you have to be uh, um, paying attention to, yeah, the more that you could put the emphasis on the energy of the vibe. Yeah, absolutely. Which and is more uh, impactful. Yeah, that's, that's if, you know, when I, I do lectures, not as, not as many as I used to do, but I used to do lots of lectures for magic clubs, magic societies, uh, and at um, conventions around the world. And I always used to say, if there's one thing I can, that I get across to people in the audience, is that stop chasing the next great trick. You know, yes. there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing with magicians that, they think they'll be successful. People will sort of think they're a great magician, but they're not quite there. What they need is that next trick. The next one's going to be the one, the next great trick. And they continually chase the next great yeah. trick, thinking that it's a trick that makes you a great magician. Zero. And it's not, it's it's stagecraft. You, you could have zero, zero skills and you could be an incredible magician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, honestly, you know, if performers like Darren Brown, for example, he doesn't need no. to do the tricks. He could just hold an audience captivated, just telling stories and just engaging with them. And there's an old saying, it's not the trick, it's you. If the audience like you, they'll like your tricks. You know, they, but, but, it, but it's not the tricks that make them like you. I mean, you know, that is the least of it. The most of it is your stagecraft, your stage presence, your ability to engage an audience. You've got that and you can keep an audience enthralled with a thumb tip. You really can, you know. Well, you well, I'm a hundred percent in agreement. <laughs> Ex yeah, totally in agreement. Yeah, you, yeah so you don't need. And no, no, go ahead. You don't need. Go no, ahead. I was gonna say you you don't need expensive. I mean, obviously, Darren Brown does employ expensive electronic devices, etc., and and people backstage doing various things. But you don't need that. You know, you, once you get to a certain level, you can do that. But don't think that's what you need to become a great mind reader, mentalist, magician. What you need is the other skills, which the are present. to do with audio audience management you know stagecraft stage skills and every time if you read any of the great tomes on magic or mentalism they will always say take acting lessons yes and everybody sits around at magic clubs and societies and goes yes 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 and this is accepted wisdom this is very wise you know, no very one does wise information but nobody does it no one, nobody no one because does they it. think they, they don't <laughs> need why do i need acting skills when i can get when the tricks will do the thing yeah, no they won't the tricks and then and, and since i've taken acting lessons myself and sort of have engaged in performances that is pure acting i can't tell you how what a difference it makes to your 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 stagecraft, your confidence levels, your ability to walk out in, into an audience and, and and entertain that audience. Uh, so that you know, as well as saying stop chasing the next trick, you've got far, you've got by far enough magic now to last you a lifetime. Concentrate what on other things now. I would say also invest in some acting lessons. Really, even though deep down you don't think you need them, I promise you, you do. Uh, you know, save up. Stop buying magic tricks. Stop giving all your money to the magic retailers. Save up and invest in some acting lessons. Uh, that 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 you know will will pay you more dividends than chasing the next big thing. No, I totally agree, and I think a good example for that is that if people want to would like to have an example of how you go about presenting that, uh, I think that uh, you know, like your uh, the hands of destiny, mm. and it's it's a force deck. Yeah, but it, everything yeah. is all the rest. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's 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 quite criminal, really. The whole, that 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 whole the, the the hand of destiny. You know, literally, when I was performing full time uh, for about a year, I specialized in wedding receptions yeah. and corporate events, 
and I literally that that one trick yeah. literally paid paid all my bills for about a year. And all it is is a marked deck, and all the rest is theatrics. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, I, 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 routine that's similar to that, and that is one of my strongest routines. The people, because they kind of, instead of being focused on your method, like your technical doings, they're gonna, since that you're not doing anything, all the attention is going on you. So they're like, there's, he must be doing something in the words or something because what he's saying is manifesting. And the more that they kind of dwell into that, the deeper that they go, you know, because they want to have an answer. People, they, they, they desperately want to have an answer and they will grasp onto like the craziest thing sometimes. It's like, yeah. So when you're able to like uh, thread the needle like you do with those stories, it, uh, I, I think it brings them on a journey more than just a, like an experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So, so phase two is basically you've got all of that inspiration in there and now you need to incubate that. Yeah. Uh, I've, like I've said, it, some people like to have a glass of wine. Some people will go on a vacation. Some people smoke a joint, whatever, like close their yeah. boat. Uh, how do you go about uh, leaving those ideas just sit with you? Well, I mean, I, I think the the inspiration <laughs> isn't isn't really a, a a conscious thing. You know, the inspiration will seep in subconsciously from you know from whatever art or performance you're you're sort of experiencing around you or your, your own life experiences so all of that inspiration sort of seeps into you subconsciously and then sort of it's sort of bubbling away under the surface and then occasionally it will burst forth and well, uh, uh, when, when i was married i'm not married anymore but when i was married we had a dog and i used to have to walk the dog twice a day and i used to curse having to go out twice a day and, you know <laughs> in all in all weathers you know walking across the fields with with a with the dog i mean I, I used to curse him i enjoyed it really but it was during those moments when i was alone with the dog in the middle of nowhere you know on, on, in the countryside that i would ideas would come to me in that sort of moment of silence when i was away from you know there was nobody around me there was no distractions and that's when the ideas would bubble up in my head Do you and i had some of that yeah, I, I don't meditate. No, but uh, I, I, I do think this. You know, when you, when if you, if you, if you have a something where you know, if you walk a dog in the countryside, or you, or you go hiking, or you, you know, or anything that just takes you out of that bubble and takes you away to somewhere quiet, that just gives you time to think. That's when you give yourself the opportunity for these ideas to rise up in your yeah. brain. The, the other time it happens is when I've had a few glasses of wine. After half a bottle of wine, I can, you know, I'm, I, I, I have many, many great ideas after half a bottle of wine. The next morning, they may not be quite so great and they may need some editing and filtering and some of them may not make the cut. But, um, but yeah, you know, anything like um, wine or any other substances will always help, as, as artists throughout history will attest, yeah. will, all, will always help the creative process. There's a, there's a phrase that's uh, sometimes accredited to Ray Bradbury, and I don't think it was Ray Bradbury okay. that said it at all, because he doesn't sound like him. And uh, so I don't, I, 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 I don't know who it was, but the phrase is, write drunk, edit sober. Yeah, yeah, that makes and, sense. And, 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 and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be sloshed on a bottle of wine no, when you're no, writing. No. But what it means is when, when, when the idea takes you, just go with it, you know, and don't worry about grammar and spelling and no. making it right. Just get the words down, just get the ideas down um, and get them out, you know, almost like uh, you, uh, when, when that moment strikes you, it's almost like you have to get it out. You've got to get, get yeah. it, you know, scribble on pieces of paper or tap away on the keyboard and then leave it, you know, overnight, maybe even a couple of days um, and then go back to it and then make sense of it, make sense of what you were trying to achieve. Um, so, so that that really is how the ideas sort of come out of me, either in a moment of silence when I've just got time on my own and the ideas are allowed to bubble to the surface, or after sort of engaging in some, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to give the impression that I'm a complete alcoholic or <laughs> but, 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 but when my consciousness has been altered slightly by alcohol, or, uh, uh, other methods of altering yeah, yeah, your yeah. mind are, are available as well. Well, I find like see on my end, I don't drink, but um, it's like w when things are really calm, like you say, like when you uh, engage into a mindless activity, like walking a dog or even doing the dishes, something yeah. where you're kind of like in a meditative state, yeah. uh, ideas tend to like kind of uh, uh, coagulate a little bit better, like they gel. 
Yeah. I, and uh, like I was doing again a little bit of research on that, and it seems that when certain elements of the brain are more calm, it accentuates other parts where there's more uh, cognitive, where it, 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 um, problem solving, you know, yeah. where things kind of in brick together. Uh, do you find like you're mentioning that you just have to like write it down? Do you find that when you write something down, it helps to manifest it than rather just having it in your mind? Oh yeah, I mean, sh absolutely. You know, the, the number of ideas I've had in my mind that just stayed in my mind and never yeah. came out. If you if you if you if you write them out or at least even type them onto your computer screen, then that's the first step, isn't it? That's made it I real. It so then, so then it's out of you and it becomes a physical thing. And I think, and then of course, you you that's the first step to making it a reality. That's the first step to making it happen. Totally, I, I really agree. I think that there's something there. Not to go with the whole abracadabra, like I write so it, it manifests, but when you put it into motion, it's kind of like you bring it into existence. Yeah. And that, like you say, it's the first step for a cascade of activities like uh, yeah. to happen, and hopefully something good comes out of that, you know? Yeah, and it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it often takes on a life of its own, almost, where well, yeah. once, once you've sort of given birth to it, as it were, uh, then it sort, of, it, it sort of almost creates its own destiny. Because if you take say for example when i i wrote the, the 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 white dress play based on the ghost that i saw you know i i thought i want to i want to get i want to use this story as a catalyst for something that i'm going to be involved with and i knew i wanted to be involved in the theater and not necessarily for it to be anything magical no no tricks involved so i i'd already joined um, a local theatrical group group an amateur group that sort of put two or three plays on a year just for experience, just for the experience of getting out on the stage and performing. And so I, I wrote the play and then, um, and then, so then it was real. There was a real product there. And then I knew some of the actors from this group. And so I just sent them messages on WhatsApp. Yeah. And by, and by that, that point, it was too late. It, you know, it had, it had escaped out of my apartment and had gone into other people's and, and it sort of manifested itself in other people's lives, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so then, and they, 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 you know, they read the script, they loved it. They said, yes, let's make this happen. And the whole thing by then, it was out of my hands. I couldn't stop it by then. And that all happened by taking it out of, out of the out of my consciousness, putting it down on paper. And then it sort of almost, it sort of almost took care of, its, uh, took care of itself. It's magical, to be quite honest. I find it's very magical. And it's something that um, I tend to like try to uh, keep that as a, um, a, a habit, like a good habit. Mm -hmm. And this is a perfect example of that because basically I had the idea of the project, then I drew the logo of what it was, and then I made a trailer, and then I imagined who would be good on there, and then I made everyone's posters without even them asking. And like, I, it was all, it, you know, like the expert, like if you build it, they will come, you know? Yes, yeah. Absolutely. And then I sent it to the people, and it's it's been like super well received. Like I'm super happy, very uh, grateful of all of this. Uh, and I think that the goal of this project is so that once that there's a body of work accumulated, since that everyone has like the same questions, I'm hoping that something will emerge from this, like a, a golden rule, you know, or something like that. Uh, and in the worst case scenario, it'll give uh, people perspectives on how to approach their creative endeavors and uh, see that there is a common uh, co a commonality within other creators uh, globally, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Phase three. So we've got the incubation, finally. You've had that, that last sip of wine and bang, I've got it, you're here. <laughs> I'm yeah. writing a play. Yeah. Uh, so for you, that eureka moment, what happens to you? Do you, like I was explaining, when I hit that moment, I have to get up, I have to act immediately. Mm. Yeah. Uh, for you, how does this happen? Like, uh, how do you know that the idea came to? It, 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 it becomes an obsession, to be honest with you. It's, uh, it's a very weird thing. It's like, it, I, not, not, you know, the, you know it, creatively, the doubt, if, I, if I'm in, in the moment, let's say, so when I was writing the white dress, we'll take that as, as, as an example, I, 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 I couldn't be involved in anything else creatively. I just wanted to, to write this story and make it perfect. Um, and also other things around me, because so, you know, I, I, I tend to, um, yeah, at the end of the day, I tend to, you know, how I relax is by watching movies, essentially. So, I, but I would all, only watch movies that were in that genre. So I would only watch movies that were sort of ghost story movies, not not necessarily even horror movies, but, but you know, especially 
ghost stories, stories about haunted houses with a ghost in them. Um, I would only watch movies that were on, on the same sort of genre as, as yeah. what I was working on because it became this whole, you know, I, I didn't want anything else coming in from the outside that was different from what I was working on. And I tend to work quite quickly, sometimes too quickly. So, you know, I, I will, I, I'll, I'll be so eager to get the, the sort of project out and finished that I, 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 I would often, if I was to give myself good advice, and, I, and if I was to give anybody else good advice, is once you've got it out and on paper or on, you know, on the hard drive, leave it alone for yeah. a month. Just yeah. leave it, stop, step away from it, and then go back to it with fresh eyes when you've almost you know, forgotten I'm, I'm, what it was. Yeah. And, oh, and yeah. come at it with fresh eyes and you can see things. That's great advice for other people, but and I but it's not advice that I can take because I've become so sort of excited by it that I'm like, yes, that's it, it's done, it's done, it's finished. And I want other people to see it because I'm because I'm so excited about it. Yeah. I want other people to be excited about it. So in the past, I have been guilty of not giving a project or an idea enough time to sort of um to incubate itself yeah and so so if, if if i was to give people a piece of good advice including myself that would be to once you think the project is finished step away yeah. from it leave it for a month and then come back to it and then you'll be surprised how how you you know the, the sort of the things that you see that you can make it better uh, what you can cut out, what Lee's adding, you know, with all, almost like you're a different person approaching it. You're not, you're not the maniac who created this thing at sort of one o'clock in the morning, tapping away on the keyboard because you've got to get it out. You come at it sort of as a, a calm, you know, relaxed human being uh, who can who can sort of appraise the subject sort of with a with a level head, without all of that passion that that creators often have. Uh, see, and as I say, that's great advice, that. but I, it's not advice I take myself. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I, I totally agree. And uh, coming like just a parallel, like uh, with that whole uh, having a glass of wine thing. Uh, in my past life, I used to have a, a record label. And one thing is like when, when you write music, sometimes you want to listen to it with like fresh ears, like as if it's being listened by the spectator, you know. So I kind of found that sometimes by having a, a substance or whatever, detached just enough so that I could listen to myself critically. Mm, and ah, yeah. oh, that's rubbish. Like that part, <laughs> oh, that part is incredible. It should be, you know? Yeah. So, but, uh, so basically with that uh, Eureka moment, once that you have that, it, we go to the next phase, which is uh, basically exploration. Uh, do you tend to do multiple versions of that one project to kind of um, cut out the fat or more along the lines of what you're saying is that uh, you'll create something and then you'll leave it on the back burner, come back to it a little bit later. Which would bring me to think that I tend to do that as well, uh, or other creators do that as well. But sometimes what happens is that you'll have multiple projects because the time that you, something's on the back burner, you're not going to wait to start training again. Yeah. So you're going to start training because you're just waiting at that and you've got those little nests waiting like a little bit everywhere. <laughs> you know? no, but then I... I if I was to be completely honest with you, I tend to be completely obsessed with one project. Okay. And once, uh, in the past, once I, I would say that in the past, a younger me would have, once that project had been done, uh, I would then move on to the next project. Okay. So it, it becomes sort of all-encompassing. All and then I would release the project and then I'd be onto something else. You know, that, 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 that stage was done. I, I, I can't think of a time when I've had sort of multiple projects on the go at the same time with some sort of percolating and some okay. sort of waiting for me okay. to come back to it. Um, I tend to be, with me, it tends to be all encompassing where I'm Blinders and you're on that focus. Absolutely. This is what I'm on about, yeah. And once, it, once it's been, once the project is completed, then I sort of, I, I don't become bored with it, but it, but it's like, that's finished, that's done. I know. And now I move, and now I move on to the next thing. What I'm doing now with what the stuff that I'm working with now is that once you performed a play once yeah. in a theater you don't throw it out you know you make it better you, you make it better for you and yeah and you get better venues and you sort of take it other places yeah. and, and and especially because in the past I've only worked I, I've worked with me just me but now there's a sort of a group of six seven people around me all all invested in this project and you know, and we try to see where we can take it, how far we can go. So there, there's no sort of, there's no chance of me sort of dismissing it and saying that's done. I've, you know, I've done that. We perform that. You know, we can sell the PDF and and sort of move on. 
so uh so now i am entering a stage of my life where i will be having various projects on the go because as well as organizing new venues and new places to perform the white dress i'm also about to enter rehearsals for a different show uh that's about arthur conan doyle and harry houdini oh. um, and about about their relationship uh that's going to and this is this is going to be performed in in june so i'm just about to enter rehearsals for that one and i'm playing arthur conan, conan doyle of course who else <laughs> a, sort <of> type, <laughs> a sort of typecast uh and so so i i am entering a stage creatively where i will have multiple projects multiple things on the go at the same time which is quite a new experience for me i'm not used i'm not used to that i'm used to being completely obsessed with one project once that project is finished i move on to the next project but now i i will have several sort of uh little projects on the go at the same time which is new for me but when you say like the project is finished for you is the high when you solve the problem or is it when it it becomes a life of its own and it's performed i that, that, well there, there there's numbers of highs i mean if you take from what how, my, my sort of past life in um in the world of mentalism and bizarre magic take you know if you take something like one of my earliest uh publications was the uh, jack the ripper sounds yes now for that 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 was a show that I performed so so with that it was very different it was a show I wrote and performed in London uh many times and then I decided to you know put it into a pdf so that other performers could take what they wanted from it and explain how I did things how the how the sales worked how you know past life regression worked etc etc um and so that was that was quite different to how I worked later on because what happened was because my early publications were quite successful my my first publication was a paranormal entertainer that was based on work you know for a long time before I got into being a creator I was just I was, I was working as a as a host of seances of ghost hunts etc so the paranormal entertainer was me writing about what I knew same with Jack the Ripper seance and same with reader of minds which is about tarot card readings uh well readings in general about how to do readings so they were all very much based on my own experiences as, as a performer. Then later on in my in my career in mentalism, I I became almost a full time creator. So then I had to create ideas, take them on the road and test them to make sure they worked in front of a real audience before releasing them. So that's very different. Um, so my first publications were simply me writing down what I did at shows then i got to a stage in my career where i was having to sort of uh, you know once a month come up with new ideas new ideas what can i do next well you know what's the next idea and then test them in front of an audience to make sure they worked and then put them into a pdf and sell them because my career had sort of changed from pure performance to being a creator who sold who sold books and pdfs so that that all all had to change um i did have a point i can't remember where i was going at this point but <laughs> But, but yeah, so there was this change. The, the high, the high of resolving. Oh, so, so, so the high, the high, with, at, the, at the start of my career, the high was just performing, was just going out in front of an audience. Hey. Yeah. Um, and then later on, the high became the idea, the kernel yeah. of an idea. Um, and then there would be a second high when, when I performed it and it worked. Okay. And, there would be a, then, and then there would be another high when it when it was sold and people bought it and okay yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and that and so it's like different and, tiers like uh, yeah. the first one yeah, yeah I, I solved the problem and yeah. then okay i got a high i'm actually performing this yeah. and then it's like wow did i actually um, created something that's performed and people want to buy it now so it's yeah, like yeah. you know so, so it's, it's, so it's sort of accomplishment highs, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah very good yeah thing. yeah so so but but each project is different you know no two projects are the same you know okay. So, so some projects were created out of necessity, you know, because I had bills to pay. So I was mercenary and and prostituted myself and sort of would just come up come up with an idea because I needed to sell product. But there were other ideas, you know. I think the the, the, the biggest one and the, and the piece of piece of work in the in the realms of mentalism that I'm the proudest of is Midnight Side of the Mount Mind. That's what I'm gonna say that is like your opus. No, did you think that that yeah, is like absolutely. that is yeah? That was that was something that I um, that I actually took my time over. 
yeah. and did did allow to percolate. And it was a culmination of years of performance. It brought together everything I learned from seances and from hypnosis and, and from readings, from doing readings. I sort of put them all together and I spent a long time putting that together and parts of it that needed road testing, I road tested, you know, to make sure they worked, but most of it was from previous experience. And then I had, at, at the time, I had another job. I'd taken on another job to sort of, because as, as performers, you know, you're always sort of one paycheck away from destitution. So I'd taken on, <laughs> I, 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 I'd taken on no, a normal job, which took a lot of the pressure off me in terms of having to release things. And what was and so that? I, and so I, uh, sorry? What was the normal job? Oh, you don't want to know, working in a supermarket <laughs> on the checkout, honestly. Yeah, honestly. Okay. So, so I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be stood on the checkout in the supermarket having all these ideas from Midnight Side of the Mind. I sort of refining it and allowed it to percolate and went back to it time and time again. And then, you know, would think of it. So it wasn't rushed at all. And I think that probably tells in the, when, when you read Midnight Side of the Mind, you can tell that it was a project that really I allowed to grow and develop rather than there was there's absolutely no sense of it being rushed at all um, mm -hmm. in, in any sense. So that is probably the, the, in, the, in the realms of mentalism, the piece of work that I'm the proudest of, and, I, and, and that I would say is, is my standout piece of work. No, I agree. I agree because it encompasses a lot of all the other things. Mm, yeah, it brings it all yeah. together and so yeah. it, uh, takes all the good bits of everything else and puts it together and creates uh, something else as well entirely. Yeah, yeah. The ones that I perform uh, is like example, uh, three coins for your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I really like that. Uh, I like uh, um, the chimney, chimney sweep. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Well, three coins for your thoughts is a funny one because that was almost created because I wanted to sell things. And I, I, was, I, was, I was walking the dog and I was thinking, right, I've done, uh, I've written about how to read tarot cards I've written about how to read palms. I've written about how to tell fortunes with playing cards. <clears throat> and I thought, what, what else do magicians carry? What do magicians use apart from cards? And I thought, well, coins. So yeah. I thought, oh, I wonder if you can have a divination yeah, yeah, yeah. with coins that magicians yeah. would be, you know, magicians would have coins on their pocket about them anyway that they yeah. could use. And so three coins for your, for your thoughts was created out of necessity because I wanted something to sell. But it's one of those sort of... Um, strange beasts that you know sometimes uh, a manufactured boy band by mistake bring out a good record it, yeah it's sort of like that you know where you know something that was if i'm being brutally honest was just meant to be something that made me a bit of money turned w w was more than the sum of its parts i think three yeah. coins for your thoughts is is is, is, is pretty decent uh, yes. uh yeah, and, it's concise. It's like it's something that it's impromptu. It gives a uh, room for per, a person to perform with their own personality. You could do it with something borrowed or your own. The personality of their, their coins talks for itself. It's a great segue to something else. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things that could be done with that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the Chimney Sweeps Oracle, I, I like Chimney Sweeps Oracle purely because of the number of people who thought the backstory was real. <laughs> the, the chimney sweeps really i mean i love chimney, I, I love the whole idea of, of victorian chimney sweeps yeah i love the scene in mary poppins where the the chimneys the chimney sweeps on the the rooftops of london you know at sort of as the sun's going down i, I think it's a very that's a very sort of uh romantic imagery and so i i wanted to do something with that and i thought what if the chimney sweeps were these magical creatures you know <laughs> that, you that sort of are capable of doing magic and sort of exist halfway between light and night you know light yeah. and darkness you know people who are sort of used to handling hot colds and breathing in smoke almost as though you know they don't breathe oxygen they breathe smoke so these sort of very magical creatures and the idea struck me that wouldn't it be great if they as well as cleaning out your chimney they'll tell your fortune as well and so <laughs> that, that, that that idea but, but what i love is that people believed it was real they thought the backstory was real and yeah. and and they didn't get that i was just having you know i've just been playful yeah. having but, and some guy was doing a an exhibition in a museum about um, Victorians and, and and chimney sweeps and the jobs that people did, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of the dirty jobs. And he was a part time mentalist, you know, um, magician, and he'd read uh, the chimney sweeps oracle, and he got an actress to read the intro. Oh wow. Um, uh, as part of the uh, as, as part of the the the, um, the museum exhibition, 
Wow. So when people were walking around this exhibition, they heard this woman reading what I, so he, and he thought, because I, I made some name of some book and read some art, some author, you know, that I'd taken this bit from. <laughs> then he sent it to me and said, do you mind if we use this for our exhibition? And I didn't have the heart to tell him that I just made it up. So I, just, <laughs> so I said, yeah, that, that's absolutely fine. And he sent me the, he sent me the, the audio file. Uh, and so God bless him, you know, there was an exhibition that where, you know, some, some, some actress had read out the words I just made up you know, <laughs> about how, how Victorian chimney sweeps were these creatures who, you know, as well as sweeping your flu, would uh, would read you, read the cards as well for you. Yeah. But you see, Paul, that's a, I think the testament of uh, the qualities that you bring in your performances that you have a very distinct way of uh, illustrating verbally, like uh, the situation, so that it's very. Uh, It, it evokes uh, rich imagery for the people, you know? And once that they kind of uh, leave themselves, uh, get uh, taken away by that tapestry, all those little tidbits that you add in, in there, I bring, uh, that just heightens the experience of that story. Yeah. So it, it basically, it's storytelling, but with like a, uh, a, like a, um, another level attached to that, where there are surprises that it can uh, just uh, manifest uh, at your will, you know? Yeah, well, I think with any story, it's the detail that makes it, isn't it? It's the sort of those actual level, not just telling the story, is that giving that sort of almost that touch of humanity to it and putting yeah. in these little little details that make people believe that it's actually real, you know. And and the great magic performers, you know, do that. My parents knew nothing about magic at all; I had no, no no knowledge about how magic worked at all. And so when they would see Dynamo walking on the River Thames. They thought he was walking. They, they, they yeah, and nothing I said could change their mind. I didn't want to take away the magic, you know, and say, "Oh no, it's all a trick." But I did say, "Well, you do realize it's a TV show, and he's yeah. a magician." Yeah. And they, oh no, we, it was on. It was on the TV. We saw I it. Know. You know, I, and, 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 and it must and, be and, true. <clears throat> yeah, and they're, 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 I remember watching with my mother one of the Darren Brown specials. One of his stage shows was on TV while I was there, and he did a, a pull stop. Yes. And my mum saw that and she said to me, Ooh, that can't do him much good doing that six nights a week. Yeah. <laughs> you're, not, you're not supposed to stop your heart like that, are you? <clears throat> and so I said, so I, so I said, well, it's, it's a trick. It's, he's not really <laughs> stopping his pulse. And I, and I explained that, you know, you can get a, you an orange or a ten, tennis ball or whatever, or whatever. You just had to do it. Yeah, you, and you just and yeah, and 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 that stops. So so the pulse yeah. stops, and my mother was outraged. She said, "So he's lying to us then," and I was like, "Well, you know, strictly speaking, yes, but it's supposed to be entertainment." And that was it. She wouldn't watch any more Darren Brown because he was a cheat. He lied. Oh, she sounds fantastic. But that is that that is, you know, the 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 sort of the vast majority, ninety nine percent of the population. Who aren't magicians? Lucky them. Um, it's it's um, it's how they perceive magic. They don't know how it works. Most of them have. You, know, <coughs> you, you only have to go on YouTube and see all of the videos from the religious wackos who are saying that, that all magicians are in league with demons. Yeah. You know yeah. that David Copperfield has sold his soul to the devil that enables him to fly. You know uh, totally. because people don't understand how it works. Um, and so. There is, again, there's a point here, I'm sure, but it, but it's to do with telling the story. And if you tell the story correctly, then people will, you know, people will believe that. Well, that, that's the thing you, is that you, you you don't want people thinking it's a trick and looking and and then it becomes a mental puzzle. Then it's just a Rubik's cube that they can figure yeah. out how you did it and they can sort of backwards engineer it. But if you do it right, if you tell the story, then they're not looking for the clues. They're not trying to backwards engineer because they don't want to because they're caught up in the. In the in real the well, because there's a difference between saying, "Do you want to see a trick?" and "Hey, do you want to see something interesting?" Yeah, do you want to see something interesting? Is because you don't know when the you know that little surprise is going to happen. But the yeah. trick right off the bat, it says that I'm going to try and fool you, so the guard is going up right away. Yeah, yeah, and people don't like that. People don't like being no. fooled. You know, no. so, if you could have them participate, even you know, yeah. or the or the magic yeah. space in their hands. That yeah, is incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When it's just you standing in front of them going, no. look how clever I am. You can't figure out how I do it, can you? That's why people don't like magicians. Know. You know, uh, that's why, you know, you will get people say to you, oh, I don't like magicians. Oh, no. I agree. Because they come across as smart asses. Exactly. 
who just want to be cleverer than you and want to make fun of you. That this whole sort of idea of the magician who takes to, who who has a volunteer on stage. I mean, you've probably experienced it where you get a volunteer on stage and they're terrified that you're going to make them look like a fool because that's what magicians do, you know. And that to me is horrible. You know, that's the last thing I want. You know, for through all of my work, if I've used volunteers on stage which i've done many many times i've wanted them to be the star of the show the star exactly yeah it's all about them not me exactly which which for, which, which for most magicians is like mind-blowing because they well, want to be the star it's never supposed me. to be because of us it's yeah. never supposed yeah, to be absolutely because... absolutely not it's, it's not, never it's us. not us we're just the tour guides we're the yeah. people who take them on this journey and show them how wonderful they are or that the we're just a witness to something that we saw that was amazing and we just want to show it and share it that's it we're yep. just the yep. the uh, yeah yeah yep. absolutely implementation the final phase so you've got this uh, idea you, it's, it, you know you went through all the fat you cut everything it it uh, holds water now you want to try and bring that so it's viable mm -hmm. for me personally that's like that hurdle where it's like how do you take something that you're you're proud of it works there's a, a, a kind of like a need for it but how do you present it so that it becomes something that is uh, marketable or how do you get like uh, people to invest in your idea so that they could try and market it yeah i think well there's uh, i think there's, there's something that i'm sort of i i think i'm quite naturally good at and it's something my my, my dad um who my, me and my dad were very different people very different people he was very down to earth he was a businessman he was a you know conservative with a small c and a and a capital c you know he was a very <laughs> of a businessman you know down to earth none of all this rubbish and of course i was into horror films and sci-fi films and superheroes and you know daydreaming about things and so I, very different very different individuals but the one thing that he said that has always stuck with me is you don't sell the sausage you sell the sizzle. Ah, and yes. So, so, so I, and so, so, so what you've got to do with one, once you've got your idea is know how to get people's attention. You know, it's, yeah. it, it really is. I, I think I, it's something that I'm quite, quite good at naturally, um, sort of knowing what people want to hear. And because I'm so, so sort of, and, and, and now that I'm, I'm doing exactly the same thing with theater shows, <clears throat> getting people's attention um, to want to buy tickets to go to this show. And I think because I'm so immersed in the sort of culture of that, I've seen how people have marketed movies and, and theater shows from the 1920s onwards. I know, I, you know, I, I, you know, all the, and you again. You were born in the 20s. And yeah, no, no, but I mean, I've, you know, <laughs> just, uh, I've <laughs> Wow. And, you are in pristine condition, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wine. It's, ah, it's, it's called being pickled. Um, so um, no, but, but but seeing how people have done it in the past, um, and, and and I love looking at you know movie posters and oh, magic posters, you know, or, and and seeing that, that how creative people are with you know the titling, the the, the strap lines, you know, the sizzle. We call it the sizzle line, the thing yeah. that gets you, gets your attention. So so I, I I love all of that. And I think because I'm so immersed in that culture, I'm quite good at knowing what people want to hear uh, and what's going to, to, to grab them, to, to, you know, sort of bring them in, get, yeah. get the bums on the seat, as it were. Yeah. You know, yeah. they, one of the things, that, there's a reason that that show was called the Jack the Ripper Sounds. It didn't have to be a Jack the Ripper Sounds, but I knew that Jack the Ripper sells. Jack the Ripper is, you know, yeah. it, it yeah. sounds yeah. awful. Jack, Jack the Ripper is sexy. Sounds awful. No, you know, no, no, I understand what you mean, yeah. But, 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 but I know that you see a poster for the Jack the Ripper sounds, you're going to look it twice. Looks, it grabs you. Yeah. 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 It even just the awesome. visuals from that is always marking. It's like very striking, you know, someone mm. in like an alley. It's it, yeah. very graphic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so, so giving your, your project the right title is important, but even more important is a strap line. The, the, the sizzle line, what comes after me? Cause that's, that's what's going to really, and the imagery as well, you know, the, the imagery is very good, you know, it is, when, yeah. I, when uh, the the first performance of, of my play, the white dress, I mean, the white dress itself isn't an amazingly um, wonderful eye catching or attention grabbing title, but the strap line was the last great ghost story. So I think, and I think that <laughs> works quite well. And then when I we performed it in my hometown, uh, my home city of, of Sheffield in England, and 
when I was doing a lot of the marketing, we referred it to uh, as Sheffield's answer to the woman in black or Sheffield's own woman in black. So that people straight away knew what my show was about because I had a reference. They all know, you know, they've all seen the film or the stage show, Woman in Black. Everybody um, in the UK certainly is aware of the Woman in Black. And so straight away, if you said, what, what's this show about? And I said, oh, it's, it's Sheffield's own Woman in Black. You knew immediately what it was. And, and yeah, and, and <clears throat> I can't give any advice on that, really, apart from that's all, that side of things is almost as important as yeah. the, the creation. <laughs> and I don't, and, 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 and I'm terrible at marketing. I'm ter- ter- no, I'm not terrible. Mark. I'm terrible no. at the business side of things. I'm terrible at the business side yeah. of things. You know, the whole thing of, you know, bookkeeping, putting my te- taxes in. I'm, you know, I have pieces of paper everywhere and then I do it last minute because I'm terrified of it and it's all, you know, it's not my thing at all. But the marketing is part of the creative process, you know, getting oh, yeah. the right title, the right sizzle line knowing how, what you know the, the right copy for um you know your, your description i enjoy doing that as much as i do the creating because that, that is a, for me it's just as creative it's almost taking what you've created and distilling it down to sort of a yeah. paragraph you know you the have, uh, elevator pitch absolutely you have one paragraph you know you, th- you have three sentences to sell this project and if those three sentences aren't right then nobody is going to buy this beautiful well, thing that you've created I, I would have the impression that you would maybe be the type of person who could just build a whole project off of a title. And, so, and sometimes I have done. Yeah. yeah, I've got a, at the moment I've got a project sort of bubbling away in that sort of fermentation at the moment. Yeah, and all, and all I've got is a title. Yeah, and it's an idea for a one-man show about the Invisible Man. The story. That's of the me. Man. <laughs> is it? I actually That's wrote it. an album called Tales from the Invisible Man. Oh wow, cool! So, and so, it was so, all the uh, <laughs> little snippets, uh, vocal snippets from the original movie integrated. Oh, wow. into, yeah, great. So I, I thought about doing a, a one-man show for it. Oh, that'd um, be but good. But the, the, the only thing I've got at the moment is the title, and the title is "The Man Who Turned Himself Invisible." <laughs> you got so the got that. right here. <laughs> yeah, so I've got the uh, so I've got the the ideas bubbling away. When yeah. so, you know, sometimes these ideas, nothing happens. You know, you know, I've, I have so many ideas that I yeah I I go through my old papers and find ideas from years ago that just never just never made it you know just got discarded at the wayside almost oh, i'm guessing do you have like everyone the messy drawer yes i have a i have a small table um in the corner by my by my laptop and every now and again i have to go through it it's this these pages and pages of printer paper that i've just got things scribbled on them ideas scribbled on them some of it incoherent some of it i look at and go what the hell was that supposed to be i have no idea what that is yeah. Other things you think, oh, that, that's that's not a, you know, but they haven't made the cut, you know, that they, you know, yeah. it's a year later and they've just been gathering dust and it's, you know, it's never going to happen now, you know. Uh, but yeah, hundreds of ideas, too many ideas, you know, and very few actually sort of make it out onto, on, you know, to be actually created. Well, there's only 24 mm-hmm. hours in the day and I've been Absolutely, like, yeah. this nice. like, I don't know how many sleep this night, like, which is, I'm uh, trying to release a pack of cards. Yeah, yeah. The marketing part of it, it's so overwhelming. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. To be able to like just get it, I'm like, I'm at that sizzle line thing, that point, and how to condense that, and then like in video to make it captivating so people understand everything. It's a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you yeah. don't do that well, you're not even That's you're right. not you're kind of like devaluating the work that you did. Yeah, I mean, you, going going back to the to the play, the white dress. You know, we we sold out. Um, which is great. So then, that you've sort of justified, you, you've justified your your confidence and your belief in your project, and it's out there, and people have seen it, and other people are performing it, and, and and it's this wonderful occasion. But if you don't get the marketing right, and you walk out onto the stage or in front of the audience, and there's three people sat there and rows and rows of empty seats, how heartbreaking would that be for this this thing that you've given birth to that you've I created, know. and all the time you've invest, invested. And nobody's bought a ticket for it because yeah. you've got that last hurdle wrong. You got that yeah. last little bit wrong. So yeah, it's, yeah. You have it's, to keep uh, enough team to be able to do that final part. 
It's mm, just as yeah, important yeah. as the rest, you know? It, it deserves yeah. to see the end of day, so you should, you should keep a little bit of energy to be yeah. able to finish that on the right note, you know? Yeah, that, 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 that last bit is almost like boasting about what you've done. It's like showing off, saying, yeah. look, look at this wonderful thing that we've created. Um, yeah. So don't so don't be bashful about it, and you know, yeah, don't don't be afraid to sell the sizzle, as my dad would say. Yeah, that's a great a piece of advice. I mean, uh, I think we're getting close to the end of this whole like going to the five questions and everything. Uh, I think there's excellent nuggets that uh, you've shared with uh, us, and uh, that's um, been a pleasure. Be um, of great value to uh, the people who discovered this. Um, just maybe on the final note, uh, would there be uh, something that you maybe want to share in regards to uh, final advice or something like that to uh, people who want to try and uh, uh, find their way within this mystical craft? Um, I would, the only advice I would say is, it's going to sound awfully twee, but really, you know, just follow your dreams, really. It's, you know, we, we probably only live once, although the jury's out, but, the, but we probably... <laughs> We probably only live once. And my advice to myself has always been, I don't want to be on my deathbed and thinking to myself, I why didn't have. I do this? Or why yeah. didn't I do that? Why was I too scared to do this or that? Or why why was I too concerned? The worst that's going to happen is you'll fail. Yeah. And then you exactly. can and learn then, and then, and start and then again. On your deathbed, on your, and then on your deathbed, you can look back and go, well, at least I tried this. And at least I tried that. Don't if you try and fail, at, like do, you won't have the regret because at least you went and tried it, you know. Yeah. But you're always yeah. wondering what could have happened. That is, it's not fun, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always remember my, my dad talked about my dad before in, over the past hour. Um, he always dreamt of. Well, he always said when he retired, he was going to coach um, a kids' football team. And he also wanted to open a small golf shop because golf oh. and football were, were his two passions. Uh, he was very sports oriented, where I was very sort of arts oriented. Um, those are the two things he wanted to do when he retired. He retired and he did neither, and then he died. Ah, oh. I'm I'm not going to be that guy. I promise you. No. So so don't you be that guy either. No no no. no. I think that that's a, that's a beautiful note to uh, cap off this uh, incredible interview. Uh, I really appreciate everything. It's been, uh, I hope I wasn't too uh, persistent maybe over the time that- uh, Oh no, I... not at all, no. I was, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was very busy at that. When you first got in touch, I was very, very busy doing another show that we haven't talked about. And then I got COVID and then I was yeah. doing this white, the white dress rehearsals for that. And then the director got COVID. So there was a lot of sort of pressure building up, but, uh, but no, no problem at all. Cool, cool. Well, I hope that we'll be able to keep contact uh, going forward. And if ever there's any questions or anything that I could help with, well, don't be shy. I'll uh, I'll do my best to be of assistance. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.